Hi and welcome to Innovators number 12. What's more important, retaining your independence of mind, body and spirit or selling your artistic soul? Innovator number 12 is an anomaly, a pop star and a key player in an underground music scene. Some people have stated that he has sabotaged his career, but one thing can be said. He is fiercely independent and it appears no one can tell him what to do. In the words of Dan Hancock's, Innovator Number 12 has frequently disowned his creations, quit his record labels, dismissed the entire music industry, flaked on gigs and festivals, and announced his retirement from music altogether. When an artist goes overground and they become pop, have they sold out? Searching through the internet, there are so many comments about so many musicians who have sold out. However, what exactly is selling out? Becoming popular? Making music that appeals to wide audiences? Making money? Most musicians and artists wish to make money from their music. Without the backing of a record label, then what do you do? British dance music from the 1980s and onwards created a model that you could work with if one was prepared to hustle. Start your own record label, get your music pressed up, load up the car and get on the road. Innovator number 12 did that and more. Innovator number 12 has released records on independent and major labels and walked away from deals that could have made him very successful, but one could argue he has retained his artistic values for doing so. Money does not seem to be the motivator for Innovator number 12, as he's funded many artists to get their own breaks rather than invest or save his money for himself. For some of you, Roman Road will mean a lot, for some of you will have very little reference at all. However, rarely is it possible to trace a music genre to an actual address or specific location, even though all music has to come from somewhere. Rejected from the UK garage scene, Innovator Number 12 and his friends started a little scene up that would turn into a British musical export that now has a hold across the world, and not just E3 London. Known as the godfather of grime, I give you innovator number 12, Wiley. Born Richard Cowie Jr. in 1979, from the age of 11, Wiley lived with his father in a council flat in Clare House, a 22-storey tower block in Bow. His father was involved in the London reggae scene and sound system culture, and had a small home studio set up that Wiley would learn to use. Influenced by the drum and bass scene that was thriving in and around London, Wiley and his friends got into DJing and then MCing at house parties across Bow. As Wiley said in an interview with Dan Hancock's in 2007, the root of all this grime business was house parties, proper house parties with a proper system, all across Bow and Newham when we were teenagers. We'd go and jump on the mic and clash each other. Wiley began to take his music more seriously during his teenage years, particularly when Rinse FM was set up in 1994 by Wiley's schoolmate Dean Slimsey Fullman and Gordon Genius Warren. As Dan Hancock states, Until Rinse, Wiley and his friends were only known to a handful of enthusiastic people in their neighbourhood. Now suddenly they could reach a wider audience. Throughout the mid-90s to the millennium, the rave scene in London was a restless one, constantly developing new ideas and moving the sounds on from jungle, drum and bass, onto UK Garage. Young producers, DJs and MCs would then do so as well. By 2000, as part of the pay-as-you-go cartel, Wiley was releasing records. Described by Lloyd Bradley in his book Sounds Like London, the Garage Grime connection can be traced to the pay-as-you-go cartel. Interviewed in ID magazine, DJ Target explained, We all had sets on rinse, me, Wiley and Maxwell D had a show, and we were called Ladies Hit Squad at the time. Plague, Slimsy and Genius, who started Rinse, Major Ace and God's Gift, they had a show on a Sunday afternoon. For some reason, every Sunday afternoon when their show was on, the Pays You Go network used to go down, and everyone could call into the studio for free. It kept happening, so after the fourth week they were calling it the Pays You Go show. Their show was doing really well, our show was doing really well, so we said, why don't we team up and call ourselves Pay As You Go Crew or Pay As You Go Cartel. 
From DJing on Rinse, Pay As You Go started playing at raves around the country, and their name and profile grew. Releasing a number of self-released singles, they signed to Sony Music Entertainment, gaining success with the top 40 hit Champagne Dance in 2001. The UK Garage was beginning to have an effect on chart music, however, friction in the Pay As You Go camp would begin to signify the end of the group. After Pay As You Go Cartel disbanded in 2002, Wiley founded the seminal grind crew, Roll Deep, which at times has counted Dizzy Rascal, Skepta and JME as members, amongst many others. As a collective, Roll Deep existed from 2002 through to 2013, producing a stable of artists that have been key players throughout the evolution of grime as a genre. Again, a fractious group, many members have left under a cloud, having fallen out with one or more members of the group. As Dizzy Rascal describes in his interview with Lloyd Bradley, the scene started off as a whole side of things. It was much more street, grimier. That's why they call it grime. In Dan Hancock's interview, Wiley said, it's dark garage really. It's music that was trying to be garage that didn't really fit in, so therefore it became its own thing. While Dan Hancock describes it himself as, grime was an outsider sound with its own slang, its own logic, its own rules created by young men or really boys, with some notable exceptions, grime is overwhelmingly male, on London council estates. It soundtracked the lives of a generation of people ignored by the music business. In the words of DJ Target, Garage was cool, and at the time, Garage wasn't really known for MCs or lyricists, more for hosts on the mic. As the next generation, we had other ideas and our MCs wanted to spit actual bars and tell stories over the beats. That's when our production started to cater to that, becoming harder, grimier, with less female vocal samples. It was more like a metamorphosis. The media called it grime, and before you knew it, it was its own scene. In ID magazine, DJ Target explained, Before the internet and YouTube, if you wanted to hear or see grime, you had to go to Eskimo dance, go and buy the records in Rhythm Division. You had to listen to the radio. People used to write about grime being a scary scene. There was only a few outsiders that weren't shook to get involved. There was incidents like there would be anywhere. But it was more stereotyping. Loads of black kids with their hoods up. Grime and pirate radio are inextricably linked. One would not have grown without the other. With stations like Rinse FM growing their audience daily through stronger and more powerful transmitters, able to infiltrate greater areas of London, genres like grime and dubstep would develop and build on their scenes. By 2003, the money he was making, Wiley reinvested profits from vinyl sales into time in better studios, while he and Dizzy Rascal then both signed solo deals. When producing music for Roll Deep, Wiley was also exploring textures and techniques and invented an entire mini-genre of low-key, emaciated, stripped-down instrumentals. The first in an ongoing series of ice-themed tunes, Eskimo was the blueprint for this micro-genre, which Wiley dubbed Eskibeat. The track Ice Rink took the concept of MC tools to the next level. Instead of just being sold as an instrumental for MCs to use, it was released in some eight versions featuring different MCs spread across two 12-inch singles. It constituted a de facto rhythm album, much like the albums from his father's record collection that Wiley would have heard as a youth. As he describes in his autobiography, Esky, Igloo, Ice, Cold, that all comes from my childhood. The pain, the isolation, the frustration. Some of my music represents being in a dark place. Wiley and fellow producers started visiting vinyl pressing plants and cutting the beats they were making on their home PCs, onto 12-inch white labels. Wiley was one of the many young producers who quickly realised that, with a profit of about £3 on each unit, shipping the white labels around to record shops could be a better way of making instant cash. As explained by Dan Hancocks, Wiley was prolific. His peers would have, at most, two or three records available in the shops. At the peak of his Esky Beat period in 2002 and 2003, Wiley's music would often cover an entire shop wall. His seminal instrumental track, Eskimo, released in 2002, sold more than 10,000 vinyl copies alone, with no record deal, no manager, no PR, 
no artwork, no adverts, all sold from the boot of his car. Wiley felt the moment had arrived for Roldy to capitalise on the growing mainstream interest by making a crew album, using his earnings from the white labels he'd sold. In the summer of 2004, he paid for the rent on a residential studio in Bermondsey and invited not just his crew, but pretty much the entire grime scene. There were 40-odd MCs and producers hanging out from 9am each morning, eating, drinking, smoking weed and using the on-site games room. Making Roll Deep's debut album, In at the Deep End, was a collaborative process, but Wiley was at the helm. When interviewed, DJ Target said, He'd always start with an A4 piece of paper and a brainstorming session, and that piece of paper would then turn into the holy tablet for the album. We'd start writing down song titles, concepts, who's going to feature on which song, and by the end of the project, this one bit of paper is just like filled with writing from all different people, stuff scribbled out and changed. Obviously the others would chip in with ideas, but it always stemmed from a wily vision. What this means is, individuals immersed in a productive senius will blossom and produce their best work. When buoyed by senius, you act like a genius. Your like-minded peers and the entire environment inspire you. Roll Deep's debut album sold over 60,000 copies and landed the group on top for the pops. But after a while, the music industry's enthusiasm cooled. The artists who had been signed... <clears throat> Roll Deep's debut album sold over 60,000 copies and landed the group on top of the pops. But after a while, the music industry's enthusiasm for grime cooled. And the artists who had been signed were promoted, but without much urgency by people who generally didn't know what to do with a largely unfamiliar sound. And so few of these artists would ever dent the singles charts. Within a few years, much of the scene's infrastructure had disappeared. Vinyl sales were declining. Illegal downloads were becoming more common. Pirate radio began prioritising less confrontational sounds such as dubstep and house music. And the London Met kept on shutting down club nights before they'd even happened. In 2008, with grime to all intents and purposes dead as a scene, Wiley produced a commercial electro beat, which would become Wearing My Rolex. This track became a new template for MCs such as Tinchy Strider, Skepta and Chipmunk, who began getting hit singles with similarly accessible, chart-friendly, dance-based pop songs. Wearing My Rolex became Wiley's first big hit, reaching number two in the charts, and transformed him into a pop star rather than just a cult hero. But like all Mavericks before him, Wiley has courted success and disaster in relative equal measure. As Wiley describes in his autobiography, from 2007 or 2008 to 2013, I just had to make money. I had to feed my children. I still made grime, but that wasn't selling. He also provides the reason I always try to do a little thing for the chart and then go back to grime. I was always trying to push grime onto people who liked wearing my Rolex, but what I came to realise is that it didn't work in the long term. If I never made pop tunes, I might not have made it through. It was me doing stuff I didn't really want to do. In the lyrics of Talk About Life, Wiley describes the record industry as Labels say that you can have control, but labels lie a lot. He acknowledges that he's had a few unsuccessful relationships with record labels, but also some successes as well. The difficulty is, as an artist, Wiley's vision is not always the same as the demands from the label. The label will always have a perspective on who or what you should be. He's openly admitted to taking record label advances and then not recording anything due to these artistic differences. When Island Records wanted to put out the Elusive album in 2010, there were disagreements over the choice of tracks. Island wanted 15 or 16 from the 200 that Wiley had written. This issue continued and then Wiley snapped. He launched into a Twitter tirade against his manager and business partner John Wolfe and then began uploading 11 folders of unreleased material and these tracks became known as the zip files. Wiley said at the time, I just need people in England to listen to me I need people to embrace me, otherwise I'm just in my own little world going mad. And people who I want to hear me can't hear me. 
I've got all this music sitting on hard drives, and in the end it started to make me feel sick. I thought, let me give it away, and then move on to make the greatest music I've ever made. I just had to get this out from under me, then start again from scratch. The zip files are just the foundation. Some might argue that Wiley is a difficult character to work with, Wiley by name and Wiley by nature. He's fallen out with several other artists he's supported over the years, and the historic beef between Dizzy Rascal and himself is well documented and still continues 15 years after the event. His manager John Wolfe has also come under fire, having been sacked and reinstated many times because of decisions Wiley disagreed with. So why is Wiley innovator number 12? Like so many innovators before him, Wiley was able to pull together a scene from friends and associates and help propel the movement forward by feeding it production styles and techniques, giving opportunities to protégés like Dizzy, Tinchy, Strider and Skepta, who most certainly have cemented grime as part of the fabric of pop music, with their own successes. Wiley also continued to work in the scene while its popularity dwindled at different points over the last 15 years. As he said in 2007, it takes time, it takes 10, 15, 20 years to build a scene. Don't worry, grime ain't dead. And he was right. In 2018, grime is as healthy as it ever has been. In the words of John Wolfe in Wiley's autobiography, he's a maverick, he does what he wants to do, but there's no agenda there whatsoever. It all depends on how he's feeling in a particular moment. Wiley's musical output is prolific. Since his debut in 2004, he's made 11 official albums, along with somewhere between 14 and 29 mixtapes, dependent on how you count them. There have been several albums with Roll Deep as well, so it shows he's clearly a studio addict. When he was interviewed by Dan Hancocks, he explained, That's where I make my product, like a baker goes to his warehouse to make his pastries. As Dan Hancocks has argued, his back catalogue not only exceeds that of his peers, but most of them combined. Dan Hancocks also explained in his 2010 article in The Guardian, Wiley's frustration with the industry is partly because it hasn't yet worked out how to marshal his anarchic talent. Of the 12 or so full-length LPs he's put out since 2003, no single album captures him at his best. Like many musical auteurs, he can't live with the industry, and he can't live without it. We'll leave the final words to Wiley. I might be the king of grime, but it's never given. It's something to strive for. Even if 100,000 kids dub me the king of grime, I might listen to them, but I know my own ability. Even if I'm not at that point in time, I know I can try to be. Thanks for watching. See you next time.